questions you might have. And if you have any um, questions, if you're having a problem, try chat if, if Q&A doesn't work. Great, thank you, Ann. Sure. This morning, I thought we would do a quick overview of uh, monarch biology. So we are, we're all on the same page as we're going through our discussion today. And a little bit of the findings we have had from over 10 years of tagging monarchs in Arizona and more recently around the entire Southwest. We'll spend some time at the very end looking at why are we not seeing as many monarchs this year and also what kind of things you can do to help the monarchs by what you plant in your yard. Okay, so the Southwest Monarch Study uh, was started back in 2003, <clears throat> excuse me, and they're studying the understanding of monarch butterflies, which are best known in North America and considered almost an iconic species. They're tropical in nature and they're revered for their long distance migration. As I mentioned, Chris Klein actually started the Southwest Monarch Study in 2003 right at Boyce Thompson Arboretum. So it's so wonderful to be able to come back and share this information today. He left several years later and we decided to continue the study and, and we're very excited that we did because of the new findings that have come in line because of his foresight to start the study earlier. Uh, we expanded as a study to include monitoring breeding habitats, uh, offer educational seminars and monarch conservation activities. We'll share some of those with you too. And we are a monarch joint venture partner and a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Uh, our management team includes a board of directors with biologists, teachers, and naturalists. We have a science advisory board with Dr. Ron Rutowski. Many of you may have uh, seen him on some of our earlier talks um, uh, with the Central Arizona Butterfly Association and Scott Morris offer his insights. And we have multiple advisory teams in the Southwest states as well. So, there was long believed to be two separate ranges of monarchs in North America, the East and the West, but studies have shown it's all one population. In fact, more recently in the last month or two, another genetic study came out and uh, reiterated this, that genetically they're the same, although there could be some minor differences in how they develop uh, within the uh, United States. This is a map of sightings and journey north. Whenever you have a monarch sighting, you could record it and you could see how it pops up by color. And that helps us see the movement of the monarchs throughout the area. So while the eastern range has a large amount of monarchs, you can see how dense they are. In the west, you can see Arizona by the end of the migration actually shows pretty good numbers. In the West, there's three different tagging areas. Many want, everyone may be very familiar in the East of Monarch Watch, that is totally east of the Rockies. In the West, we have monarch butterflies in the Pacific Northwest, monarch alert along the coast, and then the Southwest Monarch Study. While we're based in Arizona, you can see we also have people tagging in New Mexico, Western Colorado, Utah, Nevada, and the deserts of California. So why do we tag? A, a lot of times people will ask us like, why aren't, aren't they fragile? Well, first of all, monarch butterflies are large butterflies and you could tell by their pictures when they're recovered in another location, they wear the tags very well. No scales fall off in the process. So by tagging, we can monitor the movement of monarchs if they're migrating, or if they're staying, and you'll see why that's important in a little bit. We can monitor longevity. If they happen to stay in an area, we know when we tag them, we can see when we continue to still see them. And it gives us opportunities to learn more key migration nectar resources because we will say, what was a monarch doing when you tagged him? And maybe he was tagging, on, he was uh, feeding on a sunflower, or flying by, we'll learn more about their activity as a result of it. 
So uh, to make sure we all understand which ones are monarchs and which ones are similar lookalikes, on the upper left, we have a monarch butterfly. And on the right, we have a queen butterfly. And these two are often confused for each other. They're both uh, uh, in the Danaeus uh, family, uh, and they look very similar, and they both use milkweed for a host plant. We'll talk more about that in a minute. They're in the same genus together. We have a viceroy butterfly here on the lower right, often confused for a monarch, but you'll notice there's this line, there's a black line with little white dots along that median line, and the viceroy uh, in the east is considered mimicking the monarch in the west, you'll notice that this one actually mimics the queen with these white dots in the wings. And painted ladies, a lot of people in the spring especially see the black, orange, and white and think it, they have a baby monarch in their yard. And we love when we get those calls. Uh, when Butterflies come out of a chrysalis and really stretch their wings. They don't get any larger. That's, they're full grown at that point. Uh, but we love that people are noticing them and we can help them identify them. Uh, they have a lot of host plants, uh, so we see them frequently. A little more information to tell the difference between monarchs and queens since they're often seen together. One of the main easy ways to look at them is when their wings are open and you're looking at the orange, you can see a queen has these white dots in the orange where a monarch is only orange in this part. So that's a real easy way to tell. There are other uh, differences as well, uh, but that's usually the easiest to find. This is on our website, swmonarchs.org if you ever have any confusion or want to compare some pictures you may have taken. So you heard me say the word host plant. There's two things butterflies of all species need. They need a host plant, and that's a place where they lay their eggs. Some butterflies lay their eggs on several plant species, but monarchs only lay their eggs on milkweed or Asclepius. Monarch larvae eat those leaves only and there's over, over 30 species of milkweed in Arizona. The other thing all butterflies need is a nectar plant, and that's where the adult butterfly feeds and they uh, ingest a sugar-rich nectar that gains nutrients and energy for flight. So remember those two, that's common to all butterflies. Some, like that painted lady I showed you, have so many different host plants, whereas monarchs are very limited to milkweed only. So milkweed has carbonyloids that make the, of the monarchs toxic to the predators. So that helps protect them. And the toxicity level varies by the different species of milkweeds. It's mainly sequestered in the wings of the adult butterflies. That's what makes them orange. It's a warning coloration. Um, some, but there are some, uh, predators like roadrunners that can overcome that chemical barrier. Uh, roadrunners are very unique out here to be found as a predator. Uh, that was something that actually came up during tagging, where uh, we were in the Prescott area tagging on rabbit brush, and people started noticing rab uh, roadrunners were grabbing monarchs off the lower part of the rabbit brush. Um, so uh, they have many predators. Um, that's one local one. Because both monarchs and queens use milkweed as a host plant, if you buy milkweed at the plant sale for this weekend, for example, at Boyce Thompson, you can find both monarch and queen caterpillars on the plants. And so here's a way to tell the difference. Uh, this also is on our website in case if you forget, the monarch caterpillars are on the left and they have two pair of filaments. Uh, they kind of look like antennae too. You know, some people would call these antennae, but actually their antennae are really tiny and we can barely see them. So these are two pair of filaments, a pair at, the, at their head and another, a smaller pair at their behind. And the queens have three pair, a pair in the center. Both of them are white, yellow, and black striped 
you can see, but it's ordered a little differently. Uh, again, that is warning coloration that says I am toxic to predators, um, but still um, it only helps them some. Identifying monarchs, uh, male and female. On the left, we have a male monarch. You could see this black dot on this lower wing. It's a male pheromone sac that's kind of inactive. They have thinner veins. Females have thicker veins. But again, if you only have one in front of you, sometimes this is difficult to see. So always kind of look for this little black dot. A life cycle, uh, a female will lay an egg, will become a caterpillar or larva, uh, form a chrysalis and become a, an adult. This takes about 30 days to go through. It's all temperature oriented. So this time of year, while the nights are starting to cool down, it may take a little longer than a month. It may take six weeks. Um, when it's really hot, like it can be here in the lower deserts, it also slows them down. But we have that uh, perfect time uh, where it takes about a month. Eggs are tiny. I think you'll see the ridges in the next couple slides, but you could see how little it looks. And they're usually laid underneath the leaf of an egg. These are aphids that are on a plant. So you could see it's just about the same size. And there's a myth that a monarch will only lay one egg per plant. And in an ideal world that might happen, but if there's, not much milkweed in the area. You can see they're literally, in this case, this is a picture from Monarch Watch, where they're actually dumping eggs because there wasn't much milkweed available that was up one spring. And here you can see all the caterpillars on this one. So monarchs are really temperature sensitive. So when we're looking at this fall and the summer as to why we may not have seen too many monarchs around, Keep in mind that the caterpillars and the eggs can only grow between in the low 50s, 53, 54, to about 91 degrees. They can survive uh, to about 108 degrees, but after that, there's almost 100% mortality. So think about some of the temperatures we've had, at, uh, especially in the lower deserts, but also in some of the higher elevations. Monarchs can fly when it's above 50 degrees um, and above 90 degrees. They like staying in, in shady areas. A lot of times in our backyards when it's above 90, if there's flowers in the sh afternoon shade, you'll see them in those areas rather than in the full sun. Uh, in the winter months, if any of them are still here, they can survive to about the middle 20s. Uh, it depends if they're wet or dry, uh, what those temperatures can be. And keep in mind, there's always little micro temperature areas. In other words, if you watered in your backyard, that little area might have a little warmer temperature or it may ne be near a building, for example, versus out in an open area that can be colder. So this is a picture of the egg I was telling you about with the ridges. You can see the ridge lines real easily here. Uh, it's a really nice picture that Mary Warren took um, on uh, Asclepias subverticillata in southeast Arizona a couple years ago. Females can lay about 300 to 400 eggs, but only about 5% of them will become an adult. And we told you they have this beautiful warning coloration to ward off predators, and yet still only about 5% will make it to an adult. I'm going to start at the spring migration and work ourselves up to where we are now in the fall. But in the spring migration, the monarch numbers are the lowest because they're coming back from their overwintering sites. They're very worn wings and frayed wings. Uh, and it's a result because these monarchs have lived around nine or 10 months. Okay. The monarchs have, uh, normally have a life cycle of about a month but those that migrate have a longer life cycle. And we'll talk about that in more detail when we reach the fall. But look at how worn these wings are. This was one we saw along the Colorado in March one year, and you could just see how beat up they are. The scales are falling off, and they've lived a long life. Uh, would love to hear their story. So from March to about August, adult monarchs are breeding, and they live about two to five weeks. So they're gonna breed 
They're gonna lay eggs and those females are gonna take off and keep flying north, northeast. They're gonna expand the range and keep finding milkweed and laying eggs where they go. It takes, th that generation will die off, this older one, and their offspring will continue their migration further north all the way up to Canada in most years. Um, and that continues, that movement continues till about mid-June. From June to August, they tend to stay a little more stationary where they are in breeding areas. They move within 30 miles roughly or so um, and continue the process of just laying eggs and, and breeding in place. So this population is growing, even though only five or 10% may survive. Every time they lay eggs, it continues that process so it gets bigger and bigger. And here in Arizona, we start noticing them more from July on, whether it's up in Prescott or the Grand Canyon or up in the White Mountains, we start seeing them more because they're more numerous. Those coming out of a chrysalis at the end of August and beginning of September, though, start becoming the migrating generation. And instead of continuing and breeding and living only 30 days, they're gonna really bulk up on the nectar of those flowers and they're gonna be the migrators. And that enables them to live a much longer time, uh, to up to nine to 10 months. So migratory monarchs are sexually immature. They're low in a JH hormone. This allows that monarch to use the energy that would normally be used for reproduction, for migration, that allows them to live nine to 10 months. And that monarch population is very big at that point in comparison to how it was in the spring. And they're very noticeable in our yards as they're flying through. Now, keep in mind what happens here in the Southern deserts in most times. In most years, unlike this year, we've had a wonderful monsoon and refresh, you know, a lot of rain and flowers are in bloom. And when monarchs reach this area and it's warm, sometimes they'll break that diapause and start breeding. Their biological clock starts ticking for 30 days, but their offspring will continue that migration, whether it's to California or Mexico. So what triggers that migration? The decreasing daylight, the sun angle, the angle of the sun at noon seems to be a trigger for monarch butterflies to migrate. There's other cues as well, but that seems to be the most noticeable one. Temperatures at this time of year, at the end of August, beginning of September, night temperatures start dipping into the low 60s. That helps them stay non-breeding. Milkweed and nectar starts dying back. We'll start seeing milkweed forming seed pods, flowers starting forming their seeds, the fall blooming flowers start kicking in, and there's over 40 genes that influence the migration, but not all equally. And signs of the migration is that their wings are re look really large compared to the ones we see breeding. Uh, a brighter color, so there's a little line saying the redder the better, the, uh, kind of an environmental cue that they're migrators. They're no longer territorial. Uh, when they're breeding, you'll see males actually set up territories over the milkweed trying to find the females that come in to mate. Uh, that kind of diminishes, that's gone in migrators. Instead, we see male and females side by side on flowers, and we start seeing clustering. now. I wish we could see the clusters that we have in the Eastern United States, but sometimes we see small groups of clusters like we have here. The one on the right was a, a, a time tap, so you saw uh, some monarchs up on South Mountain, and on the left is one that we saw along the Colorado River in the fall. So that's small groups, but they do kind of stay together. Uh, on ideal conditions, usually, but not always, on the southeast side of a tree with nectar sources on the ground nearby. If it's really windy, they may end up on another end of the tree, but in ideal conditions, this way the morning sun will reach them, warm them up, so they could come down and nectar and continue their migration. 
So when do we expect to see them here in Arizona? Well, right now, normally. Um, normally we're kind of in the middle of the peak migration time this time of year, but there have been sightings already starting in Phoenix. It's a little later than I would expect. In the last couple of days, Denise saw um, five, six, seven monarchs up in the Sedona area. Monarchs uh, were reported up in the Payson area in Prescott, small numbers compared to usual, and in Southeast Arizona, but they are here. You can see this window uh, of opportunity for them to fly through is still there. So we may see more come through as these temperatures moderate and come down. And look what happens from tagging. From tagging monarchs during their migration, when we tag the migrating generation, we have learned that monarchs can go to both Mexico and California. Uh, monarchs from the Phoenix area have gone mainly to Mexico. And then in 2016, that one year, four monarchs were, flew to the coast of California. Had we stopped tagging earlier, if we had stopped in 2010, we never would have known that. So that's why it's so important to have community involvement, people out with their eyes looking, which way, where are monarchs? Do their wings look new? Which way are they flying? Tagging, if you're interested. You can see a monarch here. This is so interesting in Camp Verde flew all the way to Mexico, Prescott to California. Think how close those are when you're on, your, on the highway in I-17. Uh, and this is a real exciting one to me. This mo these monarchs tagged in Northern Utah are our new big question mark here because the first couple ones flew to the coast of California. Then we had one that flew kind of on a southeast trajectory up to, you know, the, the Rockies run right through here and was seen here. And let me go back since I made that mistake. Then we have this one that was uh, just a couple years ago that was seen in a golf course in the Phoenix area. So we're starting to see possibly some movement of monarchs tagged in Utah coming down. And you can look down here at the bottom of the slide, this breakout of how many monarchs in from uh, Arizona. It's very close to half each go in different directions in the breakout of the other states as well. We will be publishing this updated paper soon and we'll make it public access so you can look at it. Our first paper on the status of monarchs in Arizona is actually linked on our website on our front on our home page. So you're welcome to read that and ask us any questions. Dr. Chip Taylor of Monarch Watch wrote a paper uh, with uh, colleagues recently that was published about the link of the migration to the angle of the sun. So we tested that with our data. So remember when we say, why do we tag? Because then we could look at that tagging date. When did we put that tag? Look up the sun angle and see, are we seeing this here too? You know, this is in the west, it's not in the east. And according to uh, Chip's delineation of uh, latitude for sun angle, we moved it over to the west so we could test it. So you could see these dates, which pretty much match uh, what we shared with you a couple slides ago. And if you forget those slides and when those peak migrations are, they are on our website as well under migration. So when we graph this, you can see uh, that many of ours indeed do fall between the predicted angles. This is a peak angle that was predicted for migration. And a sizable number are early here as well. Uh, and this was out of 18,504 monarchs tag, 72 recoveries. Uh, that or recovery is when a monarch is tagged and it's seen in either California or Mexico a, a significant length. So you can see that breakout on the right side of the graph. So we looked at these, the red triangles went to Mexico, the, green, the uh, blue circles went to California. So at first, uh, the initial numbers that are listed in our first paper that is online right now, we thought there was a link between these early ones here going to California and the later ones going to Mexico. But now you can see that they're starting to, to even out a little bit over time. And again, that's the, this importance of, 
um, doing long-term studies to, to not give up to learn what's happening about monarchs. So what does this mean when we put the different states in? Do we see the same pattern? So we broke this up by states for you as well. Blue is all monarchs tagged in Arizona. Red is in Nevada. Yellow was tagged in California, Northern California. Um, and Utah has the pink with the circles. And you can see there's this tendency for them to fall in the same areas. So we're, we're gonna play with these numbers a little more and learn a little bit. Uh, Baum and, and Mueller did a study that showed about a month before the peak migration, monarchs make a movement south and start laying eggs. So we started wondering, well, what could be happening with those monarchs that month before? Because this right here is the month before the migration. It's exactly a month, in fact. And so our data is suggesting that maybe any monarchs that he closed at that time could also be migrators. When we look at these numbers, look at the recoveries. If you tag a monarch during this time, period in this window here that's in yellow. Look at how you have a chance of one out of 90 or one out of 91 tag to get a recovery in Mexico or California. Look what happens if you tag earlier, one out of 255, one out of 839, one out of 494. And it, it averages out to one out of 158. But you can see how it, if you tag at the time uh, of what we'll call the peak migration, you have a much better chance of that monarch appearing in one of those other locations. Kind of a fun thing. This shows you when monarchs have been tagged in the area. So you can see it's very heavy in September and October. You can see these increasing numbers. There's little numbers around. And then we start seeing this increase in August, September, October, and then the decrease through the end of the year. And this is another reason why we tag. Remember I mentioned what happened in fall of 2016? This was prior to that fall. And the, the map looks nice and impressive, and yeah, they go both ways, but look what happened that next fall. Boom, everything just opened up. So um, that, again, you never know when you're gonna have a big year. You could look at this with the recoveries in 2016. Here's that big year that popped up. Um, so um, we wish we were having that this year, but um, we're hoping that as populations go up and down, we're gonna see a recovery here. Total number of recoveries, I mentioned were 72. This has 71, it's, it's one off. There's actually one more in California from, um, Utah that's not recorded in here yet. You can see the distribution. This is all the Southwest, not only California, uh, Arizona. But not only that, we had monarchs that were seen in Joshua Tree National Park and Palm Desert outside of Palm Springs, La Quinta, and Volcano. So we've had monarchs that have been seen long distance uh, as well to give us an idea. The Palm Desert and the La Quinta which spent the winter there, uh, which was interesting. So from when we tagged their gender, this was when we tagged them, uh, almost 57% male, 42% female, but the recoveries uh, actually were a little different. Most of our uh, recoveries in California or uh, uh, Mexico are male. Uh, we also have people when they're tagging mark uh, what the condition of the wings are. And this is on our website. You could see this one that if it's a, if they're freshly closed, just came out of a chrysalis or in their wings are in excellent condition. There are four or three. If they get more worn, they have worn wings. They're a two or a one. All of those that migrated had excellent or above color uh, condition of wings. So if they were worn, they weren't migrators. We also have overwintering monarchs that stay in the lower deserts every year. Uh, they are definitely increasing and we're looking at the temperatures over the last couple winters to see if that possible influence. Uh, we know they're in, in Tucson, we know they're in California, 
the Rancho Mirage area of California and the deserts. They're in the Phoenix area, like Havasu. And in many years, Boyce Thompson Arboretum has overwintering monarchs too. Uh, it varies from year to year. When Chris Klein was here, he never saw them over the winter. Uh, the winters were always really cold. Um, but now in more recent years, we are. So that's, again, that long-term monitoring that kind of could reveal some new information. So winter breeding and non-breeding monarchs are in the lower deserts. They're not all in diapause and they're not all breeders. And here's an example of both of them. Um, in 2019, there was this little caterpillar on the left that survived a freeze and even light snow in the Tucson area, uh, which was really surprising. You can see the color of the leaves of that angustifolia milkweed are showing, it's like uh, uh, what I call its winter colors. It's, it's showing the stress of the cold uh, temperatures, but the caterpillars look happy. And on the right, uh, we have a monarch that was tagged on October 6, still alive. Let's see, November, December, January, three and a half months later. Uh, remember we said a, a, a breeding monarch is normally alive for a month. We have a three and a half month old monarch still flying around because of their tagging. We were able to track that. That probably means that monarch on that uh, plant here, on this flower here, on this Tithonia is probably non-breeding. Uh, at least at some point in its life. I can't, we can't tell you right now if it's breeding or non-breeding, but we could have said at the time of this photo, there was some time it was not breeding for it to live that long. This is why we're worried. This is why we're concerned. These are the numbers of the monarchs that are counted in Mexico. Mexico does their overwintering counts every December. That is the time when the monarchs are most compact in the trees. When monarchs first arrive, they're very dispersed and uh, uh, usually all over the trees. Um, as the temperatures get cold in December, they compact down. So they measure the space that the monarchs take on the trees. And they have been doing that for many years. And so they stay to that measuring method because that works for them. Uh, you can see what's happened back in, uh, here was this big population crash back here. We did a little better a couple years ago. You could see how it came down here to last year to 2.83. Uh, Dr. Chip Taylor of Monarch Watch is predicting it to come down this year to be a lower number again. You can see how, even if you take this one tall number out, you can see the average numbers, how the average numbers have decreased. This is the biggest population, is the, are the monarchs in the east that overwinter in Mexico. The numbers along the California case are downright dire. You can see how, again, they had a high about the same time they did in the east. They came down, they appeared to be level. Already around 2015, 16, 17, we were meeting together and trying to decide what to do to help this population. And then never did we expect this crash to come down like it did. Um, sadly, all of us uh, that have been in touch with each other along the West are seeing that this year could conceivably be even be lower than this. Uh, the numbers are so low in Arizona. The only place the population looked good this year was around the Salt Lake City uh, area in, in Utah. They were having some of the better breeding years up to Ogden, that stretch right there. But all the other locations uh, were way down uh, from people who uh, normally see breeding monarchs weren't. I can tell you from tags, that was where most of our tags were sent, uh, that were requested and sent. Uh, Nevada, a, a person last year who tagged 150, needed three tags this year. So uh, it was very mind boggling to see these numbers as they were coming in. You may have heard that they are considering listing monarchs as a threatened species. Um, I don't want to go into the pluses and minuses of doing that because it's a kind of a, uh, it, it's a 
topic on itself that we could have a lot of discussions about and strong feelings either way. But what I would like to inform you about is what are the, what are the things they are looking at? What are they considering? We were part, we were invited to be part of sharing our data with a team of people making this assessment a couple years ago. We should get the final decision on December 15th of this year. The things they're looking at are, what are the status of the overwintering sites where the monarchs go in California? What is the status of the milkweed supply? Is there enough milkweed for monarchs to lay their eggs? Um, that's their only uh, resource. What can we estimate about the nectar supply? Uh, what are the climate related effects? Is it getting hotter, cooler, drier, wetter? What other effects? Are predators increasing, chemical spraying? What are the chances of extinction? And to kind of catch all this, of what conservation projects are in process already? So if we want to look at how do we save a species, we want to be able to go back and say, we're going to need to find more breeding habitat or migration nectar. So what's already in process going on? So what will we hear in December? We don't know. No one knows. But these are the options. One could say listing is not warranted. All right. They cannot split the east and the west. It's all one population. So if you look at the monarch population as a whole, uh, they have to make this decision. So they could say listing is not warranted. A uh, new regulation put into place a couple years ago um, for fish and wildlife was that they have to weigh how much it would cost to save a species as well as the value of the species itself. So it could be maybe it would be too much to uh, save a species, whether it's monarchs or a rare bird or another species. Listing the monarch is warranted, and we can propose it as an endangered or threatened species. So that's another possibility. So no, it shouldn't be listed. Yes, it can be. And the third one would be listing the monarch is warranted, but other species have a higher priority. Other species are closer to extinction or have more weight. Uh, so those are the three possibilities. And in, uh, in the first one, they would move ahead and come up with uh, proposal of what that would look like. You'd have a chance to give public feedback either way. Uh, in the second one, uh, I'm sorry, that would be for the second one. The first one, if it's not warranted, everything would stop at that point. The third one would mean they would eventually move and try listing them if they were still at that critical stage. Uh, so we would all have a chance to give public feedback, but keep in mind, no matter what the report is whether they'll be listed or not or the third option of the delay lawsuits are very common and to be expected so this will be a delay in the decision no matter what or the implementation of the decision perhaps is a better choice of words what are we doing from the southwest monarch study we received a national fish and wildlife foundation grant for eighty-eight thousand dollars we have created uh, milkweed habitats and provided native sunflowers for neck fall, migration nectar for Arizona State Parks that participated, U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, Tano National Forest, Coconino National Forest, uh, Pollinator Quarters Southwest, Pima County, and Arizona Game and Fish. Uh, and we're continuing to work on that process. We're working with the city of um, Camp Verde right now as well. And we've been able to identify how to create ideal monarch habitats, picking the right site to help establish, and it, usually it's enhance the areas to be more conducive uh, to uh, uh, helping monarchs grow in that ideal area. So what can you do? Uh, you can help, we could all be part of community science here. We can report monarch sightings. We'd love to hear about them so we know where monarchs are. But we also encourage you to write to Journey North and record your sightings. It's all online. It's very quick and easy. This time of year in the fall and in the spring, I write a weekly article 
about migration sightings and anything we're seeing. So shoot me an email with your sighting and tell me, what did you notice? Like there weren't any monarchs here and now there's 20 in your yard. Wouldn't that be exciting to write about to inspire others? Grow milkweed and nectar. Great time to be at Boyce Thompson this weekend with the plant sale. I'm gonna share some quick plants with you in a few minutes of what they love. Monitor milkweed. Look at the milkweed and see what you can find. Are you seeing eggs? Are you seeing caterpillars? And this will help us know when they're in the area. And you can help tag migrating monarchs. We'd love to have your support. If you have monarchs this winter in your yard, let us know if you'd like to be part of our winter study on overwintering monarchs. So this is one of the milkweeds that monarchs like in the lower deserts. We, it's actually native to the lower deserts. Uh, they used to think it was not used well out here, but you could see this female's laying her eggs right here. Um, so they do use it well, it likes full sun. Uh, Boyce Thompson had a bunch of these uh, when I was there just the other day. So it grows really well. Again, if it, it's a lower desert milkweed. So if you live in a little higher elevations, you might want to wait for some of these others. Uh, the pine leaf milkweed, uh, also they had great ones there. Uh, monarchs, this is a real toxic milkweed and they, the monarch larvae, don't survive as well on it, but it is wonderful for its nectar. So they will draw caterpillars, but also nectar. And the Arizona milkweed, Asclepius angustifolia, is actually native to southeast Arizona, but it grows pretty well in most yards and it grows in pots really well. And uh, this is probably one of my favorites because when caterpillars eat the leaves, it grows right back before that monarch even comes out of the chrysalis. So it's kind of special in that respect. So um, it's kind of one of my favorites. It needs shade in the lower deserts, but in those higher elevations around BTA, it uh, probably would do fine without the shade. Nectar is critical for this migration. Remember when these butterflies reach Mexico or California, they may not have food all winter. They're gonna have to live on their uh, weight, their uh, lipids, their fat. And so there's really good nectar in sunflowers and often we'll find monarchs all over sunflowers. Goldenrod, asters. I know Boyce Thompson has some asters because uh, I picked up some a couple days ago when I was there. Look for these fall blooming uh, native uh, migration nectars that are out all around us right now in the lower deserts, uh, the desert broom or any baccarus species they love. Uh, the Bebia juncia, the sweet bush. Uh, you can see these around the dry upper banks of rivers a lot of times, and they're often in bloom right now. On the higher elevations, as we get a little higher, if you have rabbit brush, you can see this. This is a picture I took up north. You know, several monarchs coming in during the migration all over it. And of course, the goldenrod here on the right. These are uh, perennials that will come back year after year. Um, and feed not only monarchs, but other pollinators in the area in the fall and spring, some of them. For your yard, cosmos, uh, you know, keep in mind you could start some now. Our soils are still warm and they, they may bloom during the winter unless we get a hard freeze, but you can always think next summer during the uh, monsoon. Maybe we'll get some rains next year, but if we do in July, you can get them started then and they'll be in bloom right now. Zinnias. Uh, monarchs love zinnias. Again, that's another summer plant you can start. This year is warm enough and a La Nina year where it's supposed to be warm and dry that you might even want to play with this for this winter. Lantana for your yard. Uh, is always a butterfly favorite. Um, and so uh, that's always one that you can add. The, you were used to the orange tithonia. There's also the Mexican sunflower, the fruticosa, uh, that is a perennial out here and blooms actually starting now, oftentimes off and on through the entire winter months. Desert antiratum. Uh, right now, I love this at Boyce Thompson when I was there. There were about 25 queens all over them. That is a queen there on the right side here. Uh, remember those white dots. 
but sometimes uh, monarchs will be part of it. The males, this is a male queen, you see this little dot here. They actually get a chemical from the nectar of these plants to make them more attractive to the females. So you'll notice all the males uh, feeding on this plant in the pollinator garden there. Baja fairy duster, I know we have a native fairy duster that's more pink in color. Uh, the reason I listed the bear, uh, Baja is because it tends to bloom year round out here. And um, uh, monarchs love it, hummingbirds love it, and one of our blues is it's actually one of its host plants, so it's like three in one. And so uh, I love to see plants that are so versatile. Keep in mind, we do have some winter monarchs that visit the area. And here's some things you can keep in your yard uh, if they're looking for nectar. I like to keep some of these in pots. So if there is a freeze, you can move them in and then bring them back out or under a patio and back out. Calendulas, which are available pretty much in a lot of places right now, are always a favorite. Fern leaf lavender. This has some new names right now. Uh, but it is uh, in the herb area, so um, pretty common. Uh, hummingbirds like this as well, and it fills in and will bloom much of the winter and into through the spring. I'm going to repeat this again. You see I put this in here twice because I think it's so important. We hope that you can help us monitor monarchs out here and play a part in uh, learning more about them. So remember what you put in your yard is so important with the plant sale at Boyce Thompson, but also there's plant sales at many places. If you go to our website under plant nurseries, when you go to that link, you'll see all the plant sales listed and you can pick your favorite plants there. Remember when you add things to your yard, when a monarch or any hummingbird or anyone is flying in, they don't say, oh, like in my case, Gail's yard has it. They're looking at the neighborhood. They're looking at your neighbor's trees. Maybe you don't have room for big trees, but your neighbors do have the trees. Maybe pollinators will come and feed on the flowers in your yard and spend the night in trees nearby. They look at the big picture. So don't be afraid to look outside and say, you know, my yard's too small, I can't do anything. You can. Just look at what's growing around you and see how you can best support them. I'm going to end this with this kind of dire information. I didn't want to start with this. This is from the National Weather Service. So look at these numbers from 2020. This is from the Phoenix National Weather Service. I want to be clear where it's coming in from. Look at these numbers, they're staggering. 14 days over 115, I think the old record was seven. 53 days over 110 or higher, the old record was like 34. We're at 142 days over 100. They're forecasting three more next week. We're gonna break this record. And who knows, we may break the record over 92. We only have 26 more days. I hope we don't break that one. Want you to realize how hot of a summer we've had, coupled with the driest monsoon on record. The National Weather Service reminded us that normally when one part of our state has a real dry monsoon, usually another part has pretty decent rains and they're okay. So it's not across the state. Look at this graph that they provided for us, this map. Every place in Arizona and Southern California was extremely dry and below normal precipitation this monsoon season. And look at the current drought map. Is that depressing? This is not only what monarchs have, but what all butterflies, insects, and pollinators are facing out here right now. So keep this all in mind. Um, when we are planning our yards that you really, really can make a difference this year um, in what you choose to plant in your yards. I hope you have some questions that we could talk about. This is our contact information, our website, our uh, email. Please join us on Facebook. Uh, this week's article in Journey North is, is our top uh, post this year that I just added this morning. We also have a Twitter account that we don't use as much. We mainly use Facebook. So 
um, I hope we'll hear from you. And do you have any questions? I have a few that people have sent in. Um, Crystal said, queen butterflies look so similar to monarchs. Are they pretty much the same in terms of their conservation, of feeding and reproductive habits, et cetera? That's a really good question. You know, not much is known about queens. A study came out just this spring about queens but there's really not much information about them. Um, they like it hotter. They are more common in places in the lower deserts. Uh, they do not seem to have large overwintering areas like the monarchs do. It's thought that they, uh, large numbers of them will stay in Northern Mexico, but it's not a designated area the way it is with the monarchs. So it's a really good question. I'm so grateful when we see them though, because we know they, they do have that kind of movement. You'll notice they'll be in your yards for a while, but they come in sooner. They, they can take the hotter temperatures than the monarchs can. And they're more fragile with the cold than the monarchs are. Mm. Okay. Um, another, another question from Crystal is that she, she feels like it's difficult to locate any plants that are not contaminated with neonicotinoids here in the Phoenix area. Do you have any insights on that? And I don't know, but I can't imagine that Boyce Thompson would present plants for sale that have neonicotinoids in them either. I mean, that goes against our mission, but I'm not the person that orders the plants. <laughs> so maybe you can tell us something about that. Well, maybe that's something you might wanna check, you know, and find out. Um, a lot of times it's not known, and that's the problem. It's the initial grower that uses them. Um, I do know that some plants that are grown in California are required to have them as a drench to be imported into Arizona. That's part of those transportation laws that are in place. Mm -hmm. And I know several people are working, trying to work on that. It is a serious problem. And um, some recent studies, and you may be aware of these, Crystal, already, are showing that they affect the larvae. For example, if a milkweed was drenched in, the, in, in them, the larvae would die off because of the long-term effect on the plant. But now, Dr. David James and some other studies are beginning to show it also affects the, the adult butterflies mm -hmm. and they have a shorter longevity. And oh, that yeah. is really scary. Uh, again, this is all new information. More studies need to be done. Uh, these need to be replicated, but I share your caution. I'm finding myself starting more from seed than I used to in cuttings. And I think I will follow up with our our plant suppliers at Boyce Thompson as well, Thank and just you. make sure that we're, it would, seems to be a no brainer that that should be an important uh, requirement for our, for us to buy from a grower. Um, somebody was wondering, what is that full sun milkweed called? Um, it's called desert milkweed or rush milkweed. Um, Asclepius subulata, S-U-B, U-L, L-A-T-A. -A. I have to stop and think what I'm spelling for you. Um, okay. If you go on our website under milkweeds, I believe it's one of the top ones and it says full sun. Uh, and okay. I, actually it's on the table, the first front table when I was there at Boyce Thompson a couple days ago. And it is present at a lot of milk, at a, a lot of plant nurseries as well. Good. Um, Joy got some milkweed seeds from Save Our Monarchs up in Minnesota. She's wondering if they'll if they'll thrive in Arizona. Um, she also they also purchased some plants from BTA yesterday. But what about these seeds that she got from Minnesota? Do you know what kind they are? Do they give you the species? Asclepius syriaca. Okay, syriaca is an eastern milkweed. Okay, so. Um, it's used to more humid conditions and more rainy conditions than what we get out here. Mm. Just so you're aware of that. So she'll need to add water and uh, maybe spray a little bit. I, I know you can water more, but how do you increase humidity? <laughs> that's I know, I know. And that's, you know, 
our climate has been such a challenge lately. Uh, you know, that's why I'm intending to go more towards native plants as much as we can. Um, and so that'll be your challenge. Maybe make sure it's not in full sun so it gets afternoon shade. That could help uh, keeping okay. that. It, it, let me mention one thing for anyone that's a native plant enthusiast only. If you look on our website, there's a link called Restoration. And the Restoration link has many, many plant species by elevation that we have seen monarchs utilizing, both milkweeds and nectar resources. So please feel free to access that. That is only native plants and none of our backyard plants. We try to meet the needs of everyone of where you're at. Good. Um, I also know that the Phoenix Public Library System has seed libraries mm -hmm. where you can get seeds for a, any number of different plants. And ideally, you will harvest some of those seeds after a successful growing season and bring them back to the library to share. So that's another option, another opportunity for people to find some uh, good pollinator plants. That um, is a really good idea. And if you would like to grow them and you don't know how, there's a we have that link on our um, website with videos. It's real easy. If you get seeds from out here, you don't need to do the cold stratification. You could just soak them in water until the roots come out and plant them. It only takes a couple days. It's amazing. Okay. You know, we're, we're in the southern part of the United States, so our seeds don't react the same like they do from Minnesota, Michigan, you know, the northern part of the country. Mm -hmm. Well, good. Um, now, you know, um, Holly asked in the chat window how to handle a butterfly if you if you find one with a tag and you did subsequently answer that question but what should we do if we find or see a butterfly with a tag should we try to catch it and and what's on that tag i can't read it what? from my screen but maybe yeah. you can share that with us yeah let me see if i can get a better picture um first of all you don't need to catch it take a picture uh, they do not see behind them just like we don't. Okay, so if you approach them from behind, uh, my philosophy is stand back, take a picture, take a step, take another picture, you know, just keep getting as close as you can because you never know when they're going to fly away. But if you mm -hmm. stay behind and try to just get to the side, you should at some point get a good picture where you could just zoom it in. Right. Okay, and, and then, then on our on our uh, website we have a link saying report a tag, and it'll tell you exactly how to do it. Yeah, and would love that picture because that helps document what you've seen. Yeah, in the, not just the butterfly, but the plant that they're feeding on. Or sure, sure, and any right. there's some additional information if you know it. You know, like do you know the name of the plant? What was the temperature? If you know, just just roughly, you know, just so we need to have a rough idea. We it, we add your name to the database for providing the information. If we'll, if it's okay with you, we'll post it on our Facebook page. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll be in dialogue with what you're comfortable with. Some people like to remain anonymous publicly, but they don't mind us using their name on our record. So we try to honor that. Okay, good. Um, I would want, like to remind people that uh, the members get a 20% discount mm -hmm. on plants at the annual plant sales. So come on out to Boyce Thompson and load up on milkweeds and other pollinators. Uh, and um, keep those monarchs healthy and happy. Does anybody have any other questions? This is our uh, last last couple of minutes remaining. All right. Well, thank you all. Thank you, Gail, for your wonderful presentation. Thank you for the work that you do on behalf of monarchs and uh, for helping Boyce Thompson Arboretum uh, be good monarch community members um, and i think that's it thank you very much and if anyone has any questions please don't hesitate to email thank you for inviting me thank you okay bye everybody